marks, there will be a round table uh, that you all coming for and, and uh, we will discuss this issue from uh, various, how to say, uh, regional perspectives and also policy perspectives as well. Um, so this is our second event that brings together think tankers from Taiwan and Europe to discuss issues related to malign Chinese influence in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, in Taiwan, and in the world in more general. And luckily, we can discuss it in an environment when these kind of challenges are more and more open and out uh, in the uh, policy discussions, um, both in the, uh, let's say, transatlantic axis and in other parts of the world. Uh, and the issue of today, this information is probably not someone, not, so, not something that, that we can uh, easily uh, see and grasp here in Hungary and Central Eastern Europe directly uh, on an everyday level, uh, but at the same time indirectly, I think uh, the region is pretty much exposed to this uh, problem as well. And we can see it around the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and around the vaccination campaign as well, the Chinese disinformation act actors are increasingly active. Uh, the disinformation tactics used by Beijing are increasingly becoming a challenge for not just the Republic of China, Taiwan, but the European Union, the United States, and the rest of the Western community as well. And we could see the disinformation challenge around the vaccination issues that, that I already mentioned. With this event today, we are aiming for providing our audience with a valuable insight into the nature and functions um, of pro Beijing disinformation campaigns, the regional and global significance of tackling Chinese disinformation activities, the impact of Chinese campaigns have on Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, the EU and the transatlantic community. Uh, also, we are going to discuss possible ways in which Taiwan, the sea region and the Euro-Atlantic Alliance can counter Chinese influence operation and disinformation sphere. And, and uh, just this January, uh, the European Parliament has passed the resolution, two resolutions in fact, that were uh, calling for uh, more support for Taiwan's democracy and also raising the issue of disinformation. Um, and I, we would like to thank you all for coming. I would like to thank my colleagues, Dominic Strata and Katalin Sitash for their support and, and organizing and putting together this event. And uh, we will have a wonderful roundtable with wonderful speakers. Let me introduce them one by one. Uh, we have Jakub Yanda, the director of the European Values Center for uh, Security Policy, a longtime friend. Uh, and, and he's a great advocate uh, of Taiwanese democracy and also someone who regularly raises the issue of China, Chinese disinformation with, for a huge audience. Uh, and the uh, European Values Center for Security Policy will launch its Taipei office quite soon. So, uh, Jakub, also you can tell a few words in the round table if you would like to about that. We also have Yu Yang Kuo the executive director of Institute for National Policy Research of Taiwan. If you followed our previous event, uh, he was uh, a guest there as well and, and, and gave us a, a very good overview and insights uh, into the uh, challenges uh, that China poses to Taiwan's uh, democracy. Um, we also have Puma Shan, uh, who you could uh, see and read. Uh, he's discussing quite regularly the issue of Chinese disinformation these days. He's the chairman of Double Think uh, Lab uh, and vice president of the Taiwan Association for Human Rights. And he's a vocal speaker in issues related to Taiwan disinformation. And also we have Ma Matej Szymalczyk, uh, European China Fellow at the Mar Mercator Institute for China Studies that just has been put on the sanctions list of, chi uh, of, of, uh, of China uh, as, as a, as a think tank that is probably uh, one of the think tank tanks that are doing the most in revealing the uh, malign factors of Chinese influence, but even in a, in a, in a high level of expertise. Um, so we, we would like to, uh, how to say, uh, express our support for, for, uh, for Mercator in, 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 in its fight as well. And um, he's um, also the executive director of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies. And last, but absolutely not least, 
the, the, uh, I would like to introduce Edith Inotai, also a longtime friend. She's a senior fellow at the Center for European Euro-Atlantic Integration and Democracy, and she will moderate the panel. So wish all of you uh, uh, a good event and, and raise questions in the, in the second half, if you would like to. And Edith, I would like to pass over the floor to you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the uh, introduction and for your kind words. Good morning uh, to everybody in Europe and good afternoon in Taiwan to our speakers and a warm welcome to our global audience from my part. Um, the topic of today's discussion organized by the Institute for National Policy Research and Political Capital is indeed a very timely one. China's political and international ambitions are becoming more and more evident even in Europe. Uh, but Chinese disinformation in Europe is something we're just becoming aware of. In Taiwan, this is something our colleagues and our distinguished speakers have had to live with for years now, if not for decades. In the next 60 minutes, approximately 60 minutes, we would like to talk about the main trends, narratives and the channels of Chinese disinformation, both in Europe and in Asia, and perhaps also suggest methods to tackle it identify it and tackle it. I would also like to urge all our participants to get involved in the conversation. Um, we will have approximately 10 minutes after our panel discussion, 10, 15 minutes for your questions. And all you have to do is use the Q&A button on your screen and type in your questions. Um, so without further delay, I would like to pose the first question to Professor Yuyan Kuo the executive director of the Institute for National Policy Research in Taiwan. Professor Kuo, um, there is a lot of discussion about China's increased appetite and international ambitions and their implications for the relationship with the EU and the US. But China's ambitions are actually the most visible towards Taiwan. How would you describe the current political environment between Taiwan and China? And has anything changed since the election of US President Biden and what are the tools uh, China is using towards Taiwan? Are there any ongoing disinformation campaigns? Okay, uh, thank you. Again, uh, it's quite an honor uh, to co-host this event uh, with Perico Capital. Uh, uh, to your questions, uh, I would like to uh, add, uh, because uh, this uh, confrontation, if I may, uh, between the states and, and China, no matter the president is uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, uh, the, the overall big structure uh, for the closer relation has been set up uh, years ago. So uh, with Joe Biden to a you know, very high degree uh, to extend Donald Trump's uh, policy toward China, uh, basically uh, the close trade relation uh, remain uh, very high tension. And uh, that's for China to manipulate uh, various of tools uh, against Taiwan, including uh, today's topic, disinformation. And we will have uh, Dr. Sun, uh, Puma Sun, to uh, present uh, China's overall disinformation campaign against Taiwan. And for myself, I will add uh, China's uh, disinformation campaign against Taiwan on security aspect. Yeah. Disinformation campaign uh, in security. What, how would you describe that? Okay. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint, but I don't know why I cannot share in the system. Maybe you, you, you need to allow me to share my PowerPoint in a system. Hello? Well, I think we have a technical problem here. Um, yeah. I tried to share my, my PowerPoint, but the system doesn't allow me to. So, okay. Yeah. Um, let me then just suggest that maybe uh, until my colleagues um, help you with the uh, technical issues, then I will turn to Mr. 
uh, Puma Shan, um, the chairman of Double Think Lab, and ask him a little bit about um, disinformation techniques, how he would describe a typical Chinese disinformation campaign uh, in Taiwan, what are the strategic goals, the main, main narrative, um, and the target audience. Hi, everyone. It's still my honor to present my study here. So I would like to share my PowerPoint also, but I can do that without the PowerPoint. So I'll just start with. So, I mean, so firstly, I think it's kind of crucial to map influence operation, which is kind of different from, I mean, influence operation and information operation. So China tries to wield its influence to impact the domestic politics, like military, technology, media, academia, society, law enforcement, economy, or foreign policy. So each of all these nine domains has its own importance. So that's why we try to develop a, a term called China Index. And we would like the world to know whether they have been, how serious have they been infiltrated by China. But people can only be influenced when adversary approach them. And information operation are just one way to approach the victims. And this information is just part of it. So for example, China could approach think tanks and ask if they want to collaborate with China. But this task could not be done without manipulation of information or establishing investment. So the way China tries to manipulate information or establish investment is crucial for studying influence operation. So in my study, I try to use the model to explain the basis of Chinese information operation. So in thinking about this model, there are like four points that should be addressed here. First, there must be adversaries. Second, there must be misleading content. Thirdly, there are channels that spread disinformation. And lastly, people truly believe that disinformation, which means people are really affected by disinformation. So let me address all of this briefly. There are many adversaries there in China. And in my study, I sort them into four categories. And there are uh, several different channels that spread disinformation and nine different topics China loves to engage with. And finally, there are only a few kinds of people who are really influenced here in Taiwan. So my focus today will not center on the adversary part, since there are way too many departments there in China that are responsible for this information spread. However, I will emphasize the different channels that spread and amplify this information. And later, maybe we can, if I still have time, I can talk about the victims and how we can counter this information. So originally, China could easily approach local citizens, uh, I mean, in foreign country, and ask them to circulate rumors. However, this is not necessary right now, since it's much easier to circulate the disinformation online. So when we look at the online information, we can try to include like Weibo, WeChat, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, news websites, forums. So, but how information spreads through this medium is different than how it spreads offline with local citizen. So we believe it is crucial to establish the model we, to explain how. So the model will speak to the concepts of information and investment that I just mentioned. So I will introduce, uh, so I try to introduce several modes here, uh, but these information study tend to specify the origin and delineate the path of this information spread. So for example, they often describe the idea uh, that COVID-19 messages are from Weibo, further amplified by ambassadors and circulated by anonymous fan pages on Facebook. But to delineate this path of disinformation is not easy, since you need to back up all data online, trace their digital footprint. And this method is not enough to understand the whole idea of the information operation. So what I want to propose here is that, uh, in pre, uh, I mean, in all this previous study, people love to talk about that influence operation or information operation are coercive, covert, and corrupting, which they call 3C. But if you look at the recent boycott of the H&M cotton case, nothing from China is covert. Each piece of disinformation in everything from the Communist Youth of League to People Daily, they're overt. So if you apply this covert concept to this information campaign, it does not feel right. So what I want to propose here is the concept of 3I instead of 3C. So the 3I here, the first one is information manipulation. So in this first I, all actors are in China. They're actually overt. The agents of propaganda and trolls are all visible online. And China is the one who creates and amplifies the disinformation. 
propaganda departments and trolls can collaborate like in the boycott of the H&M cotton case. And there are the two main actors in this first eye. This mode is very easy to target since they never hide themselves, but it's crucial to look into how they collaborate. And there are several nodes that should be noticed here. First, the, uh, the propaganda department has their own network of accounts, which are different from the purchased commercial accounts. And on the other hand, trolls and bots are netizens that are easier to target, as is the battlefield stretch from Hong Kong protests to the HM case. And also, we cannot rule out the connection between trolls and the CCP government, because back in 2000, the CCP published a white paper called China's PLA Prepares for Network Warfare and highlighted the multi-dimensional intrusion invention upheld mostly by trolls and bots, and actually initiated by the PLA. So lots of trolls and bots can originate as volunteers in China, but can be later utilized by the CCP. So to explain the relationship between the propaganda department and the trolls, several top accounts from Weibo and WeChat may take orders from the propaganda department or Communist Youth of League to test the public opinion in China or foreign country and love to do it during the nighttime or the time most people are commuting. And also the Chinese People's Armed Police plays a role here, but it would be too complicated to introduce them right now. And the second I here is investment. And there are three kinds of investment that should be noticed. First is the Ministry of State Security or the United Front World Department. They could directly donate to or sponsor certain groups that are capable of strapping disinformation overseas. For example, the local newspaper that has been circulated for free in Taiwan right now has been proven by us to have connection to the United Front World Department. This type of investment is overt and direct. The second one is the other kind of investment when China invests in different domains not related to disinformation, but that can later be utilized to spread disinformation. For example, the gaming industry, the live stream industry, the entertainment, they are often invested in by China. And the live streamers, the YouTubers, sometimes spread this information if necessary. They could be the nodes, but usually they're not. But in crucial times, China might ask them to disseminate this information, which is coercive. And the last kind of this second eye is how China tries to establish the disinformation market. This includes the content farms and the market that attract the rent seekers. China could actually pay someone who spreads pro-China or anti-US, anti-EU messages. For example, in 2019, among the top 10 YouTubers who received donations online in Taiwan, seven of them spread pro-China messages. And actually the top YouTuber only got 70,000 subscribers, but attract a million anti dollars per year. Another example is that China tries to pay fan pages or private Facebook groups to spread articles, pay them in foreign currency. So in one of the groups I joined, people can actually make 1500 US dollars per month by simply disseminating pro-China articles in Taiwan. So in this mode, the second eye, the actors are actually in foreign countries and the spread mode could be both online and offline. And there's a decoupling process in this mode because China could be the maker, but the amplifier and the disseminators are actually in foreign country. And since I'm on the round of time, so I'll quickly introduce the last one. So the last I is in between volunteer. Actors in this mode are everywhere. So in some cases, the money is not necessary. China can also establish what we call the ideology market which attracts certain group of people in foreign country that may got incentives to criticize their own government. So for example, the private to private chat groups could be operated by the United Front World Department and often share the video or photos that could be manipulated. So in this way, the resource could be manipulated by volunteers in this group in foreign countries who agree with the anti-government messages and then further spread this information in a very organic way. So when we often say that the social media is being weaponized, in the Chinese case, I would rather say that it is the citizen, especially the foreign citizen, that are being weaponized. So these three I have to collaborate with each other in order to have impacts. But still, we have to prove that people are really influenced by the disinformation. So even we know how disinformation campaign work, we still need to know whether people are affected by disinformation. And there are three elements, according to our study, that see whether Taiwanese people have been really influenced by the Chinese disinformation. First, disinformation itself looks rational. 
but can, could trigger negative feelings that could be very influential. Second, it is only consumed by a small group of people, so the scale does not need to be large. Third, people with no specific political stance, people who are apolitical are more vulnerable here in Taiwan. So since I only have 10 minutes, I think that will conclude my presentation right now, but uh, I'll share more during the Q&A. Thank you so much for listening. complicated and complex this whole network is and uh, how well organized it is and uh, I'm actually surprised to hear that people can make a lot of money when they participate uh, in those troll or content factories they don't really have to engage ideologically so it's just also um, a normal employment thing so um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation and I think we cleared the technical problems and then we can go back to Professor Yuyan Kuo who okay. will tell us a little bit about the, um, the national security uh, um, side of disinformation. Yes the floor is yours. Okay uh can, can you guys see my slides absolutely okay uh well, we cannot read it i have to say <laughs> oh okay but some are in, in in english some are in chinese uh I, I will just uh very simply going through some cases and then i will conclude with uh, the types impacts and the countermeasures uh for to china's uh disinformation campaign against taiwan uh on security aspect uh, so uh, this is actually quite new phenomena uh, in the past two years that uh, China's disinformation campaign started to attack uh, Taiwan's military uh, planning or activities. So uh, in June uh, 2020, uh, you know, uh, China basically uh, disinformation campaign basically going through Weibo or Twitter platforms. Uh, to spread uh, rumors or disinformation regarding uh, Taiwan's uh, military planning or activities. So uh, in June, uh, this, this rumor is uh, quite interesting. It's, it's basically saying the US is planning to deploy more than 50,000 soldiers in Taiwan. So we, which trigger uh, a huge controversial uh, both in Taiwan and uh, in the security community between Taiwan and the states. And the main, main source of China's disinformation campaign uh, attacking Taiwan is from this uh, South China Sea Strategic Situation Probing Initiative. And their uh, main communication platform or spreading the rumors is from Twitter and Weibo. And this case is uh, in July last year. Uh, this is basically saying that they, they spread this uh, disinformation through uh, Twitter, basically saying there is a uh, US uh, RC-135, uh, it's an electric patrol plane entering Taiwan's uh, airspace. So you can see uh, the flight route in southern Taiwan. Uh, <clears throat> they, they are, you know, uh, fabricating uh, this flight route of this RC-135 to south, southern Taiwan through Pindong County and back and forth. And in August last year, uh, it's basically spreading rumor on the U.S. plan, uh, military plan EP-3, the electric uh, patrol plan to East China Sea and then flying into Ch uh, Taiwan's airspace. Similar case uh, in also August, you can see the frequencies getting more and more. And this is also uh, regarding uh, a fly route of US uh, RC-135, the same plan. This is in September. Uh, the, 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 this one is basically saying the USS uh, destroyer uh, is entering uh, Taiwan's territorial water. And next one is more extreme is September last year, it's basically saying Taiwan's uh, air defense missile shoot down a uh, uh, Su-35 uh, fighter jet of China. So you can see they even fabricate uh, not only the messages, but also uh, the uh, video footprint. And also, uh, you know, they even have the number, the flight number of their fighter jet. And this one was a tragedy uh, happening last year, November in Taiwan. There was a 
uh, crash of Taiwanese uh, F-16 fighter in our East Coast. But China is basically making a story out of it. They're saying these uh, fighter jet F-16 basically landed in Xiamen airport, uh, meaning between Taiwan and, uh, you know, uh, going to China and saying this uh, pilot, Colonel Jiang, is basically under quarantine uh, in Xiamen airport. So, you know, uh, they are very good, not only at fabricating uh, stories, but also uh, high evidences. And November, not, not many days later, November uh, 12th last year, is basically saying uh, the US uh, military is taking over Taiwan's air defense system uh, on November 12th. Uh, Jan uh, January this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, this, this time is about themselves, about POA's uh, activities. It's basically saying uh, China's uh, cargo plan, YA, is entering Taiwan's uh, territorial air without uh, any awareness uh, from Taiwanese uh, air defense system, meaning they are penetrating our air defense system. In March, uh, this is even more extreme is saying, uh, March 30th is basically saying four fighter jets of Taiwan, F-16, uh, betraying Taiwan and landed uh, in uh, Fujian province, uh, unknown air base. So I basically sum up uh, very quickly uh, different types of uh, China's disinformation campaign against uh, Taiwan's uh, military uh, activities or planning. Uh, First of all, is try to uh, you know create the image of the states as a hegemonic stance against China, and second is to uh, create a controversy uh, on this uh, U.S. and Taiwan's military relations. Uh, you know, uh, evilize uh, U.S. and Taiwan's military relations, and number three is trying to uh, fabricate Taiwan's uh, stance as provocative. And number four uh, is uh, basically saying uh, China's having uh, very strong military capabilities and righteous stance uh, to unify Taiwan. And number five is uh, to create this kind of image that the Taiwan's military has very low morale. And the impact, uh, of course, number one is to distress Taiwan and its uh, international partner, including US and Japan. Uh, through all these uh, disinformation campaign. And number two is create, uh, you know, these uh, disputes between Taiwanese government, Taiwanese media, opposition party, and the general public. Number three is create uh, this uh, confrontation between uh, Taiwanese society and the military. And internal Taiwan, including to uh, stir uh, fears, discussion on unification and a presentized cross-strait policy, of course and also uh, create uh, internal uh, disputes or distress within Taiwanese military and between the military and the, and the general public of Taiwan. And also uh, to attack present size uh, policy in revitalizing uh, or to create Taiwan's uh, indigenous defense policy. So that, those are the impacts. And I think countermeasures, I, in general, I believe uh, China's disinformation campaign uh, on Taiwan's security or Taiwan's military is basically creating opportunities uh, for, for Taiwan, more opportunity for Taiwan to cooperate with uh, our international partners. So for example, like today's uh, webinar is one of the example that, uh, you know, this opportunity was created by China. So we got this uh, chance to discuss uh, China's uh, disinformation campaign. So when China goes low, we go high. Uh, they want to go. They want to hide something under the table. Uh, we need to uh, make ourselves even more transparent. Uh, we go public uh, to release all their uh, disinformation and fake news uh, on Taiwan's. Uh, I mean, especially on Taiwan security uh, issues. So and secondly, I believe we shall create a public platform. Uh, joining of uh, Taiwan's uh, defense ministry, foreign ministry, and the think tanks. I, I think think tanks are very important because uh, 
uh, people are tired of uh, official statements or official sayings from the government. So I don't think uh, government organizations are um, you know, suitable uh, taking the role uh, to release or to uh, justify uh, China's uh, disinformation campaign. So I believe uh, to create a public platform uh, jointly by the government organizations, uh, as mentioned, defense ministry, foreign ministry, and also think tanks uh, in uh, justifying uh, to uh, release uh, China's true intentions in manipulating uh, those uh, fake news or disinformation against Taiwan's uh, security cooperation. So that's uh, all what I need to say. Thank you. A compact picture of the security challenges. Thank you very much for sharing uh, it with us. Uh, I think we will still uh, come back uh, at a later stage on how effective those, um, those theories, those uh, disinformation campaigns are. But I would like to shift a little bit our focus now uh, to Europe, and then we return uh, at the end um, to, to Taiwan again. So in Europe, what we witnessed lately is massive Russian disinformation campaigns, especially after the invasion of the Crimea. So I would turn to Mr. Jakub Yanda now, the director of European Values Center for Security Policy and ask him, as he did a lot of research also about Russian disinformation campaigns, uh, how he would compare uh, Russian campaigns to pro Beijing campaigns? What are the main similarities, the differences, the methods, narratives, target audience, and whether we really have massive pro Beijing disinformation campaigns at the moment in Europe, or this is something new? Thank you, Edith, and thank you for to Political Capital Institute and our Taiwanese partners and friends for having me here. Uh, actually, the, the, this is exactly the reason why we are actually opening our office in Taipei this year, because we want to actually keep sharing practical knowledge between European and Taiwanese experts over what are the disinformation and influence tactics of those hostile regimes be it China or be it Russia, because unfortunately they seem to be actually uh, using quite similar tactics. They, they might have different goals sometimes, but uh, the tactics seem to be corresponding with each other more and more um, when we compare them, at least what, from what we can see in Europe. So I'll briefly uh, try to compare Russian Chinese tactics, which we see, and then I'll try to look into what are the strategic disinformation operations which we see being done by China, um, which are obviously, again, quite similar to what Russia does. So um, I think, uh, what does Russia and China share in Central and Eastern Europe, the region I come from? Uh, those are at least three uh, areas or three efforts which, which they have in common. One, revenge against the United States. There are different reasons for it. Russia and China have a different history with the United States. But at the end, they are quite similar in what they want to do. They want to basically push out uh, US presence from this region, from Central and Eastern Europe. And we could quite, quite simply see it uh, sometimes in public messaging, sometimes in non-public activities, uh, because clearly Russia and China see Central and Eastern Europe uh, as a, I would call it a battleground or basically a place where there, uh, I mean, Russian and Chinese influence could potentially be more impactful in the future, uh, and they, they clearly see that uh, the, the what they what they call United States or U.S. influence in this region is not seen as friendly to Russia and China. That then that's quite that's quite understandable. The other uh, other I would say objective, which is not only limited to Central Eastern Europe, is uh, what we call efforts to decouple United States and Europe. There are obviously various um, internal challenges and problems between US and Europe, but clearly we see that this is a major, I would say, objective for um, uh, Russia and for China at the same time to actually um, help or make sure that uh, there is more there are more divisions between Europe and the United States uh, because Ch China would like Europe to be 
most likely not to be a direct ally of China. That, uh, that doesn't seem to be possible, with some exceptions like Viktor, Viktor Orban's government or the Serbian government. Um, but clearly, China would like to have countries in Europe to be uh, more neutral. That's how they call it, or more, uh, which so meaning that they would not be standing on the American side when China actually engages in a strategic conflict, which we, we might call another Cold War, or we might call it differently. But at the end, there is a major, I would say, a strategic conflict between United States and China that is already happening, and it will be happening in upcoming years and possibly decades. So China would like to have Europe um, uh, not so much on the American side. That's obviously the, the strategic effort. There are ways how they do it, uh, but clearly this is the objective. And for, for Russia, it's quite similar, even though Russia is much more aggressive in, in the tools they use for, achieve, for trying to achieving this goal. Um, uh, so, I mean, um, the, the uh, Russian tactic in Central Europe, elite capture, energy dependence, strategic corruption, disinformation campaigns to, Russians, to support Russian strategic goals. I think mean, that's quite clear and uh, we discuss it um, many times. Um, but uh, what China tries to do quite often in this region is using elite capture, meaning uh, capturing some part of our elites or our establishments which, which then uh, I would say are uh, organized or, or uh, suggested to actually do what we call strategic disinformation operations, which means that those are not only individual lies, uh, lies and disinformation cases, which we see happening as part of Russian disinformation tactics, but uh, that, that is about changing or managing the narratives or the discourse in general, uh, which at the end, I mean, for example, if you ask, uh, I mean, if you ask on China in most of the capitals across this region, uh, the, main, uh, the main, probably the, the first response you would hear would be, yes, China is all about economy. It's really about trade with them. And this is a great uh, success of strategic disinformation operations of China, because many of people who are their proxies and assets actually are spreading this, um, this narrative uh, that we actually should not be really discussing national security or human rights matters when it comes to China or our relations with China, but it's only about economy or only about trade. Which is which it is not. So uh, there are some there are obviously differences, and this is something what we see China doing quite well. Uh, I've seen quite well. We could see it with the Hungarian political establishment or the governing uh, political establishment in Hungary. We have seen it with part of the Czech political system as well. Clearly, the Czech president, Czech Social Democratic Party, Czech Communist Party. Those are the political leaders. Many of those have actually su supported the, these Chinese efforts, which are at the end quite hostile because that's some. That's some something when, where you try to turn a blind eye on first national security matters when it comes to China. And there are serious questions we have to ask ourselves about our relations with China and human rights aspects, which, which are not only symbolic, they are, they are like um, physically happening in some parts of China and they are like real lives. Uh, this is not only a theoretical discussion. So those are, I would say the big differences, but, uh, or similarities and differences, but I'll just briefly try to run through what we see as the, uh, what we call operational objectives of China uh, when it comes to messaging in Europe or at least center in Eastern Europe. And, that's, and I think it's quite similar across most of Europe. Um, they, they are at least four, um, we call it uh, narrative objectives. So things where China tries to push it, its own narratives through uh, local proxies, as I said, the elite captured individuals or other tools which China uses. So, I mean, first, clearly Chinese messaging on Taiwan. Second, uh, Chinese messaging on 5G, even though there is quite clear that China has actually lost the battle in Europe with some small exceptions, but, see, but, um, but overall you could say that um, uh, Chinese state companies has actually lost much of their um, potential, uh, let's say, presence in the 5G um, buildup across mo most of the EU member states, even though some, uh, there are still struggles uh, in, in some places. The third focus is obviously on human rights, which means silencing any discussion on the Uyghur issues, any discussion on the genocide which China is actually organizing in uh, one of its provinces. Um, so this is clearly one of the narrative objectives of China in Europe. And the fourth area, which is obviously quite up to date, uh, is the COVID related disinformation. And there, there are what we call four sub-narratives, 
which we see China doing and organizing in Europe. One, uh, deflecting blame from China, saying China is not responsible for the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, second, uh, China being portrayed as the savior of Europe, somebody who delivers uh, medical equipment or vaccines to Europe. Uh, third, anti-American messaging. We have seen that in Germany quite often, which is quite new. That's something what we have seen only Russia doing, but now we see a lot of Chinese actors trying to do a similar anti-US messaging. Um, and for the, the Chinese vaccine, so meaning uh, support for Chinese vaccines, which obviously we now know are not as effective as the Western ones. Even Chinese um, officials have actually said that publicly, probably they disappeared after that, but clearly uh, we have seen uh, that uh, messaging on Chinese vaccines across Europe as well. So that is, that is what we see. And I think uh, just to mention, there are two major tools which I would point out. There are many others, but two of them, which I think are very important to us to look into. First, elite capture. So clearly this is the major way how China does it in the European countries. Uh, and I would say this is the most dangerous one because then um, uh, it's not really about uh, some small uh, groups on the ground, but when you actually capture an individual who is or who are at the top of the political establishment, then this is exactly a strategic win. This is where, where it leads to elite capture and potential state capture at the end, which is obviously not happening in most of the EU member states, but there are some countries uh, like Hungary, Serbia, but uh, partly Czech Republic as well, uh, where, where we see much of the Chinese elite capture ha efforts happening with some degree of success. Sometimes they are not successful, sometimes they are. And the second thing, which I think is the, the should be the main point of our discussion in the in upcoming years is the way how China tries to economically blackmail European countries. Because the reason why European de democracies are not defending themselves that much from China, or I would say Chinese malign influence, is because they are so afraid that China will economically punish them. Uh, which is something what uh, is an obvious and legitimate concern. But then if you look at reality, we have seen China economically punishing countries like Australia or South Korea, but we have never seen uh, China doing it uh, in recent years um, against an EU member state for a simple reason, because there is so much of Chinese barking. There are so many threats coming from China. But if you look at the real sanctions or measures done by China against EU member states, they are very, very limited because China knows that if they really punish European democracies, they would lose a strategic market at the end. And that's clearly what China does not want to happen. Uh, so therefore, I'm trying to say, well, we as Europeans should actually wake up and say, look, China will not really, really punish us. So we could actually start to be uh, acting as a sovereign countries. Um, so if we, for example, see a massive Chinese espionage, we should do something what we, did to, what we do to Russia. We should PNG, we should expel Chinese uh, uh, intelligence officers who are hiding in Chinese embassies or consulates uh, and who are organizing espionage because our problem problem is that our countries across Europe are often not doing it, or they are often, I would say, they have, have much of the intelligence, much of the knowledge over what's happening, but the reaction is very, very limited because of the fears of Chinese economic retribution. And this is a big bubble which we should burst uh, because I don't expect China would really do a strategic level punishment against Europe. Um, because China would, would lose so much uh, when you look at a, at a global stage and what China wants to get from Europe. So I'll probably st stop here, but I think this, this should be the main focus of ours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yanda. And uh, I think we should start perhaps with, uh, with the EU's response. And I'm asking uh, Mr. Matej Simalczyk, the European China Fellow of Mercator Institute, um, whether the EU is uh, really up to the challenge to identify and tackle pro Beijing campaigns. And of course, as an expert from Central Europe, I would also like to ask you uh, how you see uh, specific Chinese uh, disinformation campaigns in our region. And if there is any difference uh, between the narratives used in Western Europe and in Central Europe uh, and how countries here in the region are um, responding to those um, disinformation campaigns. Thank you and uh, good morning. It's good to be here with you and, and discuss this uh, very uh, time and topic uh, of Chinese disinformation and propaganda spreading in Europe and, and elsewhere uh, in the world. Uh, you raised a couple of, uh, of questions and I hope we have enough time to tackle all of them, but I'll, I'll try to answer as much uh, as possible uh, to, to answer 
all of the, these these aspects that you have uh, raised. Um, I'll start maybe from from the point of view of Central Europe because uh, that's the region I'm coming from as well. Uh, and I will raise a few things uh, that will be echoing a little bit what what Yap has been saying and maybe maybe uh, build up on that a little bit. Um, I absolutely agree with Yap that when we look uh, when we talk about uh, Chinese uh, disinformation uh, presence and, and uh, Chinese influence or influence operations here in Europe. Uh, it's crucial that we look also on other uh, tools of hybrid warfare China is using because they are really intertwined uh, with uh, the disinformation campaigns and we should not uh, decouple them uh, because then we will uh, lose uh, a crucial insight into what's going on. Um, the issue of elite capture is especially, uh, especially troubling and, we, and when we contrast it with Russia, we see that the elite capture is something that China is using uh, primarily as a tool and then the disinformation spreading is some kind of a, of a buildup based, based upon that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we should not uh, dismiss that also these elites themselves have their own economic interests and that they, they are uh, sometimes acting of their own uh, volition and, and uh, acting in some sort of uh, interest uh, alignment with China rather than, uh, rather than uh, following some kind of, of, uh, of orders uh, by Chinese uh, handlers. Um, and, and we've seen that uh, time and again, uh, both in Slovakia and Czech Republic, that, that some of these actors would be uh, spreading uh, pro-Chinese uh, messaging for uh, the sake of promoting either their own economic interests or for the sake of promoting they, their political interests, uh, because uh, their political base would be uh, ideologically aligned with, uh, with what, what China is, is, is standing for uh, internationally. Um, an issue related to that is also the issue of corrosive capital, which is being used as well in order to uh, foster disinformation campaigns down the line. And uh, we've seen that a corrosive capital has been an important tool in China's toolbox in uh, achieving uh, presence in the local media scenes beyond the fringe uh, disinformation outlets uh, and, and moving into the, the media mainstream. Um, so, so, for example, when uh, in Czech Republic, we've seen that a Chinese company had, had invested in uh, several media, we've seen that almost immediately this media changed their narrative about China into uh, really a, a purely positive one uh, from what previously was a mixed, mixed messaging of, of uh, critical, neutral and, and positive pieces. So, so after this investment happened, not even the neutral pieces were appearing anymore uh, and, and the, the narrative to, turned purely positive. And, and uh, which was reflected as well in the choice of topics and, and obviously the more critical aspects of China were not being mentioned. Um, and, and around the same time that this was happening in Czech Republic, the same company was actually trying to buy the largest TV station uh, here in Slovakia and that went uh, quite uh, unnoticed by, uh, by uh, most of the Slovak security sector because at the time China was still not being seen as a potential adversary. Uh, or or potential uh, actor engaging in hybrid warfare against uh, against Europe, um, and and the really the only reason why this purchase in the end did not happen was uh, due to the fact that the company, the Chinese company CEFC, came into um, its own uh, political uh, troubles back in China uh, and was unable to 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 follow up uh, on this on this uh, pledge to buy the, the TV station. Uh, of course, corrosive capital should not be limited only to discussions of investment into media because uh, other types of financial flows uh, can be uh, quite instrumental in, in fostering um, the narratives that mainstream media can be uh, pushing with regard to China. And we have a very good in example of that here in Slovakia in the form of the Trend magazine, which is a major economic publication. Uh, how it was uh, spreading uh, pro-Chinese uh, narratives on uh, the issue of Hong Kong protests in 2019. Um, and, and at this time, we've seen basically a worldwide coordinated campaign by Chinese actors that were trying to push a single single narrative on what's going on in Hong Kong in light with how China has been seeing that uh, painting the protesters as, as domestic terrorists being financed from abroad, uh, and this narrative was being pushed uh, in various media. Um, and, and even though Chinese embassy was trying to push this 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 specific um, topic into media here in Slovakia, most of them were actually uh, shown that they they, they have a quite a, quite a lot of internal resilience and refused to publish this kind of of, of stories. Uh, so what the embassy did instead then was that they actually bought um, ad space in one of the magazines and printed the article as an editorial 
so uh, so so that the article would not go through the regular um, editorial process in the in the newsroom and rather would go only through the PR department of the magazine and would appear there there without any sort of uh, editorial uh, check. Um, and, and, and Chinese have been trying to do that uh, again uh, last year in light of the pandemic, uh, but, but it seems that the magazine in question have learned from their experience um, with the Hong Kong protest because they faced quite a lot of backlash here in Slovakia and uh, then uh, they, they uh, apparently refused to publish a, publish a similar advertorial on the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, there's uh, also apparently a learning curve within the media on how to deal with uh, financial flows uh, from from Chinese uh, Chinese actors. Um, naturally, these this mainstream media are not the only tools that uh, that China has been using here uh, in the region, and uh, uh, it's only only one of the tools that China has at its disposal to spread the, its its narratives. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of that is happening in the fringe uh, fringe outlets that are known for uh, publishing uh, pro Russian uh, information as well. Um, and and uh, we basically see that, that they are uh, publishing these stories uh, more or less uh, due to their own ideological alignment uh, with China, uh, rather than uh, for for financial reasons. Also, although that uh, certainly plays plays a role uh, as well. Um, it's interesting to note, though, that uh, for example, social media are not really uh, used that much by Chinese actors uh, in Central Europe. Uh, we've actually seen that a majority, that most Chinese embassies or Chinese ambassadors uh, here in the region have only started using social media uh, in the last two years. Uh, so, so they are uh, quite behind on, on the trend uh, there uh, compared compared to, to the other countries. And uh, for example, here in Slovakia, they were not even engaging that much in, in some kind of a wolf warrior uh, diplomacy on, on social media. Uh, nevertheless, we've seen that they were uh, engaging, especially uh, here in Slovakia, on, on publishing uh, tweets and Facebook statuses on the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, around uh, last year, we've seen that actually half, almost half the content that was being uh, put on social media of the Chinese embassy here in Slovakia was focused on, uh, on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, included a coordinated uh, rumor-breaking campaign. So these were kind of like a fake fake fact-checking uh, campaigns uh, that were trying to disprove claims uh, made by uh, Western media about the pand pandemic. Uh, an example included um, this kind of uh, rumor-breaking campaign uh, surrounding the fate of Dr. Li Wen Li, uh, Wen Yang, uh, who was uh, punished by, by Chinese authorities for um, raising awareness about the, the outbreak of the coronavirus in Wuhan. Um, in any case, uh, the issue of effectiveness of this campaign was raised several times, and we see that uh, based on on a, on a public opinion surveys, that these campaigns are probably not as effective as the Chinese might be hoping, um, because we see that uh, in the last, uh, based on the survey we did last year, that um, majority of the European population are actually reporting worsening views of China rather than improving. Uh, the, the portions of societies that, are, that have improved views are usually uh, quite small and typically um, these are the people uh, here in Central Europe that, that already have a positive feeling, for example, about the communist past of our countries. So, so uh, it's not really, uh, it's not probably a result of these campaigns that they are, they are improving views, but rather of the underlining uh, ideological alignment of these people with, with China. Um, yeah, so uh, and, and, and on the topic of COVID-19 and uh, this, the information campaign, obviously, as Yaku has mentioned, one of the, the, the um, one of the goals was to disassociate China from, from, from the pandemic. And, and again, we see that this has not been very effective uh, because uh, in our survey, when one of the questions asked the respondent was their um, first spontaneous response when the topic of China is raised, and uh, we see across the EU that that, that the top uh, topic in most countries is COVID-19. So there's clearly the associ association with the pandemic uh, has not been uh, broken um, by these Chinese uh, campaigns. Um, so uh, the, the, the second part of what you've asked was, um, let's say, what can the EU do uh, or what can be the countermeasures? And of course, uh, it's really important that we um, engage on this topic in a sort of uh, coordinated way within the EU rather than uh, engaging only on, on the member state level. Um, because uh, we've seen time and again that even Chinese campaigns are not only um, 
aimed at single country, but are rather transnational in nature and, and are targeting the entire entire block. Um, of course, the, the, basically what we can what, what we can um, what I can recommend as as four measures that should be adopted on an EU-wide level is um, first and foremost uh, first and foremost uh, improving the transparency levels of Chinese engagement uh, with the bloc. Um, much of what China is doing, especially in the realm of leak capture and, and corrosive capital, is um, shrouded in this kind of veil of secrecy and is, is covered, which, which enables uh, China to, to better uh, influence what's going on uh, in, in our country, to better influence uh, the policymakers. Um, and, and, and the very fact that we, we would make these ties much more transparent would already put a lot of hindrance on Chinese activities um, in this realm. So, um, and we've seen that improving transparency has been already uh, very crucial in target in, in dealing with, let's say, domestic corruption and domestic oligarchs. And uh, this will be probably quite effective in dealing with, with foreign strategic corruption uh, as well. So, so issues like, um, let's say, uh, publication of contracts that, have, that are made with Chinese actors, uh, so like, like uh, the Rias Memoranda of Cooperation, a public institution with Chinese actors, should always be republished online, for example. Uh, we should know who are the ultimate beneficial owners of companies that are uh, investing Chinese capital in, in the region um, and, and so forth. Of course, it's quite important that we offer a lot of protection to our media uh, because uh, we've seen that media can be instrumentalized by China. Uh, and, and for this sake, we should really treat media as a strategic sector of the economy and, 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 uh, let, and have it covered, for example, by the FDI screening mechanisms. Uh, so that uh, we know who's trying to buy these media and uh, can prevent uh, those purchases in cases of um, in cases when uh, the investor looks looks problematic. Uh, uh, naturally, an important issue is uh, strategic communication, um, and and we heard in the uh, last few weeks uh, by, from uh, from Mr. Borrell that the EU does not have the enough capacity for for this because a lot of the capacity is targeted at Russia, of course. Uh, so, so uh, basically, it's quite necessary to invest more public funds into this kind of uh, China um, expertise across uh, all possible um, governmental agencies that will be so that they are better equipped to to communicate uh, on issues that are uh, related to China and where China might be uh, might be uh, gaining upper hand in communicating their own uh, point of view uh, and and. Last but not least, we definitely need to improve our education on China because um, oftentimes we see that this kind of uh, that, that uh, adoption of pro-Chinese narratives is often done uh, out of ignorance. And we've seen that in the in the beginning of the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, that media around Europe were basically taking over uh, Chinese narratives on the on the BRI. Uh, just for the sake of just just because of the fact that there were no counter narratives being provided by local experts, and China has managed to dominate the information sphere by providing uh, providing uh, its own account of what what they are trying to do, um, and and this this pattern managed to be broken only after uh, local stakeholders started to communicate more clearly on uh, how they see uh, the potential of cooperation with China and what are the potential uh, drawbacks. Um, last but not least, we also need to recognize that, for example, here in Central Europe, uh, a lot of that influence is not really based on, uh, let's say, structural economic dependency. That's more of an issue in Western Europe. Uh, in Central Europe, uh, it's uh, really the, 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 the bigger issue is, is elite capture, uh, which brings me to my last point that, uh, that uh, what we've seen, for example, in Slovakia in the last year was that, that uh, we've seen that a Chinese uh, elite capture and, and the influence derived out of that can be actually quite fragile in the region as a, a single election and, and, and political change uh, derived out of that election can completely undermine uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese presence. And within a year, Slovakia has actually managed to uh, become from, to, to turn from a, a quite China positive country that was uh, really all about uh, pragmatic economic cooperation to country that has a uh, quite modern security strategy, for example, that raises all of these uh, security threats posed by, uh, by China, including these information campaigns uh, and is uh, engaging very openly on, uh, on uh, criticizing human rights records uh, of China. Uh, in various international fora as well.
thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, questions. Um, we have already received a few questions. Um, one is coming from uh, Lila Boos, and this is to our Taiwanese speakers. Could you elaborate a bit more on steps Taiwan is taking at national and international levels in order to counter Chinese disinformation campaigns? And there's also a question to Mr. Yanda. You mentioned that you do not see it as a real risk that China punishes Europe. Europe, however, is not homogeneous. How about punishing individual countries? I mean, from the Chinese side, of course, uh, what if uh, China is uh, punishing individual countries? So I would give the word uh, to uh, Professor Kuo and then to Dr. Shen about the potential uh, international and national uh, counteractions of uh, disinformation. Please be brief because um, we have approximately 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Chen, you want to uh, go first? Sure. OK, so I, I'll talk very briefly because it really depends. If, uh, we could talk about the government's measures or what's the efforts from civil society or as a researcher, what should we do? So let me briefly discuss that what governments did. We have several principles over there. One of the principles is called humor over rumor. So all these debunking messages shall be like packaged in such a way that the audience cannot resist to share something like that. Anyway, also, I mean, our government got the 222 principle, which means that uh, the debunking messages shall contain no more than 20 characters in its title and no more than 200 characters in its content and no more than two images appended. So there are like several principles over there. But what is, I mean, the most important thing is that what civil society does. So first, there's no typical public-private partnership in Taiwan, and that's the Taiwanese model. So on the contrary, the, the civil society tries to keep adequate distance from the government because we really want to protect, I mean, um, we, don't, we don't want to infringe on the freedom of speech. So in such practice, we just help the civil society actors and trust of the general public on their independence and their integrity and help eliminate the baseless suspicions on these actors for being part of the propaganda machines of the current government and certain political parties. And also Taiwanese government had become more aware of the harm of this information as occurrence of high profile cases also lead to the acknowledgement from the society. So as I saw the, the questions on the Facebook, um, they also say that because of the public awareness here in Taiwan, that's how we counter this kind of disinformation campaign. And, but lastly, as a researcher, I think the best way to do is that we should provide the tools or uh, to others, I mean, to other civil society to analyze whether, for example, whether the free content has been provided by Chinese government to the foreign media I mean, in other countries. And there are several like AI technology that we can compare the writing style, the content, something like that. And we, if we have that kind of tools and we can tell the world that, hey, this is the message from the PLA, this is the message from United Front Work Department. And so we won't depend on suspicions, but we can actually have real evidence to state that there's a disinformation campaign coming from China. Thank you very much, Professor Kuo. Yeah, uh, on security aspect, uh, it's a little bit different. And uh, as our, our discussion last time, uh, we were discussing about China's salami slicing strategy. And I actually found uh, lots of similarity of China's salami slicing strategy and these, uh, this information campaign. Uh, number one, uh, you're trying to, uh, you know, to, numb your nerves. I mean, try to lower your mental defense stance uh, through this kind of uh, repeatedly uh, disinformation campaign, uh, as I just uh, mentioned those cases, and making your people or your military system to get used to all these uh, you know, rumors or disinformation fake news. And number two, uh, uh, you will be very, uh, aware of uh, you are entering uh, a attrition warfare with China. You are basically fighting a giant that, I mean, you are, you are fighting a war that you can never win, that you know that. So that kind of situation is making us, I mean, making Taiwan uh, passive, powerless, and weak. 
And number three, uh, China's uh, summit sizing strategy and also this information campaign is trying to find excuses for further uh, attacks or uh, summit sizing. Uh, take Japan, for example, 2012, uh, Japanese government nationalized uh, Diaoyutai Islands uh, in East China Sea. So that was the timing that uh, Chinese start sending uh, their, I mean, Chinese Coast Guard vessels and air, military airplanes to circulating uh, all uh, surrounding Diaoyutai Islands. Uh, so it's been eight years. And the, the reality is China has changed uh, the original status quo and already created a new status quo in, in East China Sea. And number four is uh, for all, all these uh, doings or strategies China has been imposing to Taiwan, uh, very logical next step for China. Uh, I'm very afraid to say that uh, might be a surprise attack. And this surprise attack uh, might be uh, very deadly. Uh, after all these preparations uh, through salami slicing strategy and also this information uh, camping uh, to our military system. So that's that's what I have to say, yeah. Well, that's rather alarming. And um, this is much more than disinformation campaign. Uh, this, yeah. this is a real military attack you're talking it about. Is, yes. Um, yeah, there is another question. Um, sorry, there was a question to Mr. Yanda. Yes, Mr. yes, yeah. on, the, on the sanctions on individual countries. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it is possible that China might pick individual countries and uh, sanction them hard. But uh, I mean, the recent evidence in recent years actually shows us that this so far has not been the case. And um, I'm talking about the Czech Republic, where the sp uh, Speaker of the Senate actually traveled to Taiwan. and. Um, there were major, uh, I would say, threats coming from uh, uh, Chinese officials saying that Czech companies in China will be heavily punished, while in reality it has not happened, uh, despite this kind of, kind of high level visit from Czech Senate speaker to Taiwan. Uh, and at the same time, if you look at Sweden, Sweden has been a very vocal on various uh, China related uh, issues um, and China has been very vocal against Sweden as well, but in reality, I would say no real hard hitting sanctions actually happened against Sweden. So yes, we might expect that to happen in the future, but uh, at the same time, we know what China really wants. And China really wants the current uh, draft of the uh, investment deal between EU and China to be ratified in the European Parliament, which will take one to two years, most likely. And there is um, quite heavy resistance to it among uh, members of the European Parliament, uh, and also among much of the expert and security establishments across Europe, because the way how this is investment treaty or deal is now drafted, how, how the wording stands, it's a very much a losing deal for Europe. Um, so I think uh, if China actually pushes hard for some of its sanctions, even against individual EU member states, its chances for getting this deal will be very, very limited. So I don't expect China to do this because it would really cripple its own interests, which, is, uh, which are about that kind of uh, deals with, with Europe. Uh, so I might be wrong, and they might get really tough in, in upcoming years, but uh, the strategic outlook for China is that China really needs Europe, uh, and, but it can really pretty much um, kill its uh, economic links, not, not quickly, but in a matter of, uh, I would say, five to ten years, uh, we might see a future decoupling if China really goes hard against European companies, because European companies are happy from benefiting with business in China. But if they are going to be squeezed hard, which might happen if China pushes hard, they will change their modus operandi. They are commercial entities and they, they can think, uh, think ahead, even though they are making profit right now. Thank you very much. I see Professor Kuo raising his hand, uh, and um, I think he would like to comment on what has been just said. Uh, Professor Kuo? No, it's a mispush. Sorry. No problem. Then we move uh, ahead with the second question we have. Mm, and I think I will address it to Mr. Simalchik. Do you see any kind of cooperation uh, in Russian and Chinese disinformation efforts, or they are completely different? 
So um, I, I would basically divide it into two issues. Uh, one is the issue of goals and the other one is the issue of methods. And uh, when it comes to methods, we see that uh, basically the, what, what, what's going on is a, a sort of a methodological alignment of how uh, information campaigns are, uh, are done by these two actors. We see that China is using the same uh, disinformation outlet that then the Russia has been traditionally using, uh, that it's uh, using the same type of politicians that the Russia has been using as part of its own elite capture strategy. And last but not least, within last year, we've seen that uh, even uh, China has been uh, changing uh, how it, uh, how it uh, formulates its own narratives. Uh, what China has been traditionally been doing was that it was pushing one single narrative on uh, how it, it how, on what it, 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 what is its own uh, perception of, of the affairs uh, at hand and uh, within last year we've seen that it's that doing what Russia has been known for doing that it's rather pushing several conflicting narratives for the sake of confusing uh, the recipients. Uh, as far as the goals, I think the goals are uh, quite different uh, when it comes uh, to comparing uh, China and Russia uh, in Europe. Uh, I'm not an expert in Russia, but uh, my understanding is that what Russia is doing is basically uh, undermining the democratic process as such uh, and for the sake of creating uh, chaos and then that using that chaos to neutralize potential adversaries whereas China is more focused on uh, on uh, coercing people into self-censorship on, on critical uh, crit on, on issues that China deems its own core interests uh, so uh, issues like like Tibet Taiwan um, Xinjiang and so forth. Thank you very much. I would just like to have a very quick last round um, from our Taiwanese speakers, uh, just like two sentences. Uh, what should we be aware of in Europe? How can we strengthen our resilience towards Chinese disinformation? And to our European uh, speakers, there was also a question from the um, representative uh, of the Taipei uh, office in Hungary. And he asked, how can we strengthen public awareness in Europe to counteract Chinese disinformation and warfare? We have talked about it, but perhaps just to sum up uh, in a few sentences. So just like two sentences from everybody, best practices from Taiwan and uh, how to strengthen resilience in Europe. Uh, Mr. Shen, would you like to start? Okay, sure. For me, I mean, the most important part is that we have the law or the international law that could push for transparency because since they are using like volunteers or ideological market or the simple, the simple market I just mentioned is quite crucial that if we have the law to investigate and disclose certain um, infiltration to the world and telling people that, hey, this is the Chinese information operation. Thank you very much, Professor Kuo. Uh, again, I believe uh, the best strategy uh, uh, countering China disinformation campaign is uh, when they go low, we go high, and they go on the table, we go public. And then we need to establish a good platform internationally and sharing case studies. Uh, uh, especially for Taiwan, we accumulate a lot of uh, cases of China's disinformation campaign that uh, I think those are variable. And, you know, if we can establish an effective uh, platform to share those case studies, I think it will be a good strategy to counter China's dis disinformation campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanda. Will that work in Europe? Uh, I mean, Central Europe is not particularly um, uh, famous of being transparent lately. True. Uh, I think there are many lessons learned from Taiwan over technical knowledge of how Chinese organizations, Chinese entities, Chinese state organization entities do it. Uh, but for example, we can learn from Taiwan how to protect our ac academic environments because there's so much of Chinese influence over academic environments in Europe and specifically in Central Europe as well. Uh, but we have very little idea how to, to do about it. And we could actually do, uh, because there are many people who want to study China, Chinese language, Chinese culture in general, uh, or Asia in general, but we could actually engage and have more involvement with Taiwan, the democratic free country, which is friendly to us, than with a hostile totalitarian state. So I think this should be a moving forward. I'm very happy that there is more of Taiwan related engagement in Europe, and we are very happy to be part of it as well. 
Thank you. Final words, Mr. Szymalczyk. Will that be effective? Will we reach the society? Yeah. So uh, I can really echo what has been said that uh, we should learn from the best. And Taiwan is one of the one of the examples where we can uh, learn from quite a lot. And I'm happy uh, to say that uh, we, the Central European Institutions, at least, have been uh, providing opportunities for Slovak stakeholders to engage with Taiwanese counterparts as well as part of our uh, Slovak Ta Slovak Taiwan one point five track dialogue. Uh, the, the, the important issue is here that we really uh, raise awareness about China as such among the general population uh, and engage, for example, with journalists so that they have a better understanding of uh, what China stands for. Because uh, what we see, for example, is a lot of times the media reports on uh, Chinese affairs are quite shallow and do not engage in depth with the topic. And as a result, people do not, the general population does not have the accurate uh, information and uh, as a result, even though their uh, perception of China may be negative, they do not see China as a potential security risk uh, because uh, this kind of uh, information on what, what China is doing in uh, the realm of hybrid warfare, uh, for example, are uh, not being uh, made uh, as public as, as they should be, for example, in Slovakia. Uh, the, situation is that, uh, the situation is, I think, quite different in Czech Republic where, where China has already um, become uh, quite a hot topic but in other countries, it's still uh, not uh, not that big of a topic in the media coverage, and is often actually overshadowed uh, by Russia. So, uh, first and foremost, we really need to raise awareness, and part of that is also ensuring that uh, uh, China and Chinese organizations are not the only providers of China-related education in our uh, academy sphere. Thank you very much. So I think that was a very complex um, uh, webinar conversation and we have learned a lot about best practices, uh, what to be aware of, uh, how to identify Chinese uh, disinformation. Well, from Hungary, I think there is a lot written about China lately and uh, I wish my colleagues in the Hungarian media to do a very thorough job on the Fudan University. Um, with this last remark, I think, uh, we will conclude um, this conversation. Thank you very much for all of you uh, for participating and sharing your very valuable thoughts. Uh, and I wish you a very nice day, a very nice evening uh, in Taiwan and hope to see you in another occasion. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.